Hello, and welcome to the Political Institutions and Political Economy Pipe Symposium on Political Polarization at the Bedrosian Center here in the Price School at the University of Southern California. I'm Jeff Jenkins, the director of the Bedrosian Center and the Pipe Collaborative. We live in a polarized political age where support for extreme political views has increased relative to support for moderate ones. In Congress, Republicans and Democrats are more divided along ideological lines than at any point since the end of Reconstruction. In the public, Republicans and Democrats are increasingly divided along ideological lines as the share of Americans who express consistently conservative or consistently liberal opinions has doubled over the last two decades. Fears about the growing influence of partisan polarization abound as threats to democratic government become more common. The Pipe Symposium on Political Polarization brings together leading scholars from across the nation to consider the history, sources, and causes of growing ideological differences, both domestic and global, as a way of understanding how such polarization might be combated in the future. We have seven original research papers divided among three panels, with the authors investigating crucial aspects of political polarization, its origins and development in the United States, its role in elections, Congress, and American state legislatures, and its foundation and function in democratic backsliding outside the United States. Once the authors present their work, we have four discussants prepared to offer comments. Finally, to conclude the symposium, we have a keynote roundtable organized around Ezra Klein's recent book, Why We're Polarized, with five panelists. I've asked authors of papers to shoot for 20 minutes max for their presentations. Discussions should try for about seven and a half to 10 minutes per paper. And now we'll turn to the first panel, uh, which has two papers and one discussant. Uh, the first paper is authored by Jeremy Pope, and the title is Constitutional Prerequisites for Polarization, The Trap the Framers Left Us. I wanna thank Jeff for inviting me to participate in this and for soliciting these papers. I have long wanted to write something that speaks about the way in which the Constitution contributes to polarization. I wanna be clear about this, that I think I'm doing this largely because I think this is a factor that isn't given as much attention as it deserves. It is not to say that the Constitution is the cause of polarization. I think probably most of the other papers and probably some of the discussion today will speak to some of the more proximate causes. Things like the ideological nature of parties, um, and other things of that nature. But I do believe that the Constitution sets down a system and creates prerequisites that contribute to the kind of polarization that we have. I doubt this was intended, but I think that it is true. And so let me begin by simply putting up the crux of what um, I'm going to argue. And Essentially, I believe that the Constitution sets up conditions in order to gain control of the full national government. You're forced to have coalitions that are sizable and sustained, and that the ideological parties of our own period um, do not meet this. They can't meet it given their goals, given the way they're set up, given the social networks and just the nature of those parties. Certainly power can be gained for a time um, usually an election cycle or two, but not in a sustained or sizable way. I'll come back to what sustained and sizable mean a little bit later on. And so what we end up with is a kind of national politics where the parties are ideologically coherent. And this is very sensible in some ways, but these parties are incapable of meeting the bar set by the constitution to govern according to those coherent political beliefs. And I think this is generally a problem and it's worth thinking about and it, I will speak a bit later on about reform. And so the talk, my talk today is simply going to proceed along the lines of explaining a little bit about why is it that the constitution looks this way, I'm drawing a bit on my own work, I should say with Sean Trier, although he's not responsible for any of the mistakes in this paper slash presentation. Um, then I'll proceed to discussing some of what I think the pathologies are today. And I will conclude by talking about some of the possibilities for uh, reform. Let me say a little bit about why the Constitution looks the way that it does. Uh, I think it's an underappreciated fact how complicated the coalitions were. 
at the Constitutional Convention. People who write about it sometimes write about it in ways where they speak about simply the large states and the small states. And so they talk about reformers versus uh, those who uh, wanted to keep the status quo. Um, with my co-author, Sean, we have argued that it is a bit more complicated than that. We see multiple coalitions, the way we refer to them, a certain group of states, they're sometimes called the large states, the core reform states. I put them up on a map there and I wasn't quite energetic enough to draw my own map that drew West Virginia in with Virginia, but I'm sort of a, a nod to the uh, conditions of the past pre-Civil War. Um, Virginia with Pennsylvania and Massachusetts, the group of states that pushed most consistently for reforms of all different types. Uh, in blue, you see the small states and then in green, the deep south. Um, and I will mention a little bit about the deep south in particular in a second. The table that you see on your left shows the position in, in broad brushstrokes about the three most significant issues for our purposes and probably the three most significant issues for setting up the, the constitution in 1787. The core reform states wanted to change the basis of representation. They wanted a much stronger national government and they looked for an independent executive. That's not to say that every member of every delegation in each of those states felt that way, but broadly, that is the pattern that we saw. Uh, the small states opposed the core reform states on those first two goals, changing the basis of representation to make it more popular and creating a stronger national government. But it is the case that the small states, perhaps with more dissent, that's why I put the asterisk there, than you might um, see in some of the other coalitions, are they're crucial for creating the independent executive. The Deep South, um, which is essentially the Carolinas and Georgia, push for a change in representation. I think it's important to say here their, their main goal for the change in representation was to accumulate power for slaveholders. And that the, the creation of the House of Representatives was an effort to make slaveholders more powerful in this new national government. Um, you can certainly argue, and I would argue that it was the government that was created was more fair and an improvement over the past, but it, I think it's also important to be clear about uh, what they were uh, attempting to create. And as long as the slaveholders had more power in that government, they were also in general in favor of a stronger national government, uh, something that uh, the smaller states um, opposed. Now, the reason that I bring up this kind of complicated coalitional structure is just, to, I think it's useful for pointing out the features that the uh, constitution creates that lead to some of the pathologies associated with polarization. Um, I think the outcome of the constitutional convention created a situation that persists until today and is in some ways exacerbated by political history where coalitions that are going to govern at the national level have to be sizable. This is not to say that there's some sort of supermajority rule. Um, it is not the case that, you know, it's. It's a clear 60%. I am not simply making an appeal to the uh, filibuster uh, in this case. It is the case, though, that you have to control multiple branches of government that have multiple bases of elections. And what that means is that if you don't have a sizable coalition, it's unlikely you're going to be able to control those branches. And frankly, these coalitions that are created have to be sustained. And this is problematic because you have frequent and staggered elections that will shift the balance of power, especially in a thermostatic way, especially in recent elections, uh, as I allude to in the paper. And the fact that they're sustained, uh, that the coalitions need to be sustained, leaves us in this difficult spot that if you don't create rather large coalitions that can get through a series of elections and keep control of the government, it is difficult to make policy in the United States. Um, in this sense, I'm being a bit negative about what the founding uh, system set up. I, I should be clear, I don't think that uh, it's necessary to believe that everything they did was a bad idea. There are certainly aspects of it that I admire, though there are things that I would change. But I think it is important to be clear-eyed about what they created and the problems that we are struck with, because I think it is difficult for us to get out of some of these traps that they have created. Um, in essence, by having, I'm just gonna go back one slide here, but I, I promise I'm gonna keep this as short as I can so we can get to questions. Uh, by creating different branches of government that have independent bases and a, a full on separation of power system, they created this, these conditions that I think exacerbate polarization 
in various ways and create conditions that play out in American history. Uh, like I said, these are not necessarily the core causes of polarization now, but I think they are prerequisites. Um, I'm gonna have one slide that is largely devoted to explaining what is probably a more key cause of polarization in our time, and it's just the rise of ideological parties. Um, parties, as we know, beginning, I, I, it would, you could have a debate about when exactly it begins, but sometime in the 1970s and 80s and 90s began to be much more ideological. Um, certainly, we have a lot of evidence to suggest this is a process that unfolded over a long period of time. Uh, Knoll's work uh, suggests that coalition merchants packaged ideological teams in a way that has over time impressed itself on the Congress. So that when you have the work of um, McCarty, Poole, and Rosenthal and, and others that suggest the polarized nature of Congress, that is something that to some degree may come from outside of the Congress. There's a case to be made that it's especially true of Republicans, and also I think a case that case to be made that what we have is a, a set of representatives that don't represent the public very well, and uh, a Fumi and Heron paper uh, cited there. And also I think the work of Daniel Thompson that suggests we just don't have very many moderate members that are willing to serve in these ideological parties. Um, what I wanna talk about now is the way in which these ideological parties meet the institutions and in essence discover that their own goals of purity are unlikely to be achieved in the face of the situation that the constitution sets up. Ideological parties want purity of at least some degree around a coherent set of principles. This is the, a picture of the Build Back Better bill that was uh, recently voted on. And from the standpoint of the House majority, not necessarily the Democratic Senate majority, but the House majority, it's a pretty coherent set of principles. I could point to other examples, uh, certainly in the past, healthcare uh, for Democrats. The Republicans are, as we know, constantly interested in tax cuts in the United States. And these also have um, a kind of desire to promote purity but it is difficult to sustain some of these policies. Um, it is unlikely that the Build Back Better bill will be put in place uh, as it stands. I don't think anyone thinks that is likely. If you go back in time to the healthcare bill that the healthcare policy that Democrats have worked on, they definitely have never really achieved their stated goals uh, over time. And even though Republicans, I think have had more success with tax cuts, they are likely to be cut back and, and trimmed and changed. And we will end up with a kind of unstable set of policies uh, that are, are um, associated with tax cuts. In essence, what I am saying is that expectations are not met. And we have what I think partisans will consider relative policy stasis, where they're not able to put their policies into uh, place in large measure because of the constitutional requirements. And this leads to um, you know, the idea that they will need to find ways to create policy using the smallest coalitions possible. Uh, reconciliation has become a kind of uh, standard practice for American political parties, even though it has a very strange set of rules that I won't take the time to go into at this point, but reconciliation um, has a set of rules that mean that only certain policies can be changed. Those policies are subject to uh, requirements and restrictions that can't always be met, and they force the uh, the coalitions that are governing to put in place policies that can be put together essentially in omnibus bills. If you're not going to go through reconciliation, you are required to use uh, executive branch authority. Uh, President Biden, uh, though I hesitate to use a strong uh, statement here, he's on pace uh, to issue about 50% more executive orders than President Trump issued in his term because the constitutional system that was set up requires the president uh, to try to meet the demands of his party uh, if he can, or her party uh, in the future. Um, I will say that I think this trap is not all downside. Uh, I think what was set up in, in Philadelphia in 1787 and then ratified has certain features that are certainly laudable and probably good. There is a status quo bias built into the constitution that is probably good for creating policy stability, and certainly the rights of some minorities, though I think largely geographic minorities, not the kinds of minorities that we are 
more interested in protecting these days are protected. So in theory, the Constitution certainly has upsides, but the process that I hope I'm describing here leads to both cynicism, a kind of accidental and inconsistent policymaking and expectations on the part of partisans that are very difficult uh, to meet. Um, are there possible reforms? And this is what I want to conclude on and discuss the, the possibility for reform. And then I'm interested to hear what people have to say about this so that I can um, better argue this point uh, in, in, the, in the paper. Certainly you could look at party reforms and essentially all party reforms go through one path, which is to say, you're gonna want more moderate coalitions. Now I wanna point out here, this is unpalatable to activists and reformers wishing for serious change. If you have an agenda to do something significant in American politics, this is not going to be an attractive route for you. Um, but it is probably the route that is uh, more consistent with the constitution and certainly the route that is, I will argue in a second, more likely uh, given the situation. What sort of constitutional reforms exist? You could argue for four-year terms for house members. You could argue that the house of representative size should be increased. Um, Lee Drutman uh, has argued that what we should have is a kind of proportional representation inside of states. There might be other things that could be proposed. These are all tougher than the party reforms because of the way the constitution was set up to distribute power so widely that it is difficult to have a coalition that is going to achieve any of these reforms. Um, to, put it, to put it bluntly, I think the party reforms are unlikely because of the ideological commitments that parties have and the constitutional reforms are unlikely because of the constitutional standards for change. And this leaves us with quite a trap as long as we have ideological uh, parties. And I think the only contribution my paper is making is just to argue that we need to better appreciate the role of institutions and structural incentives that are helping to create some of the pathologies and things that we see vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the parties and polarization. I want to end on a note that could be seen as hopeful or also possibly depressing, depending on how you look at this. There are historical examples of single party dominance over institutions, and these periods involve probably less polarization, I think, uh, in, in many respects, though it's, it's a debatable point and we could talk more about it in the Q&A. Um, the earliest example, the kind of Jeffersonian Republican coalition of 1800 to 1820 being very dominant. Uh, Republicans dominated politics in the latter half at, in the wake of the Civil War um, in the latter half of the 1800s, the early part of the 20th century. And in the wake of the New Deal, uh, Democrats tended to dominate politics. And I suppose it is my contention that it would be healthier for um, the United States if we could figure out a way for parties to attempt to put together coalitions more like these. Um, this is dangerous, of course, because if you're on the opposite side of one of these coalitions, then you're not going to be happy about this. And the kind of competition that we see in recent years is probably something that parties do uh, want to see uh, because it means at least they have a chance of setting policy. But I think if you're thinking about the trap that the constitution set and the prerequisites that it set up, we would probably be in a healthier position if we ended up um, with a kind of situation where you didn't have the kind of close competition where no party was able to actually control government with a sizable and sustained coalition. Um, so I'm gonna put that on the table and I hope we can have some discussion. Thank you for listening and I will leave it there, hopefully a little quick on time so we can get to Q&A. Thank you, Jeremy. And that was Jeremy Pope from Brigham Young University. Uh, and now I'll turn it over to E.J. Fagan from uh, University of Illinois at Chicago, my hometown, uh, for elite polarization and partisan think tanks. All right, thank you. Thank you so much, Jeff. And thank you for organizing the symposium. I'm excited to present this paper to you. This is a paper that comes out of a larger book project on partisan think tanks and their role in modern American politics. I um, mean, in this paper, I'm examining their relationship with polarization in Congress. Um, we know a lot about polarization. We know a lot about the order of operations uh, or the order of events in polarization, uh, at least in the modern era, that we have this increase in polarization in Congress that begins in the late 1970s. People should, are, are very familiar with that. 
Um, but we also have some work um, from Edwards and Wood that suggests that uh, party platforms begin to polarize uh, right around this time as well. We, we see an acceleration of polarization, so it increases kind of mildly for the first 20 years or so. And then in the 1990s, we see a dramatic acceleration of that polarization that continues to this day. We also know that voters as a mass group as a whole don't begin to polarize until much later, uh, somewhere around 2010, give or take a, give or take a few years. Uh, and so elites are going first, which, which is important to understand causes of at least those first few decades of polarization. And we also know that Republicans go first. This is an asymmetric polarization and that we observe polarization in the Republican Party uh, well before we, we observe uh, more, more polarization in the Democratic Party. And so we seek to seek to develop explanations. So I seek to develop explanations for that first few decades of polarization. What really kicks it off? What you know starts to get to the point where other public opinion measures and other 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 types of things that have been well studied over the last ten years begin to reinforce it and, and really get us to where we are today. Um, which means we need to seek out explanations of elite polarization, things that affect elites that begin in the late 1970s that affect the Republican Party first and don't plausibly also affect voters. Uh, and that, that's what I'm seeking out here. And that's what we're going to, to use partisan think tanks to explain. But first, I just want to explore just other basic ideas that people have had about the causes of polarization. Uh, we have a lot of causes. We have many, many studies of polarization. I'm sure many people here are familiar with, the, that, with that large body of work. Um, and generally speaking, um, scholars have rejected the idea that electoral incentives were directly and powerfully connected to the early rise of polarization. So a lot of these explanations like changes in the distribution of public opinion, changes in districts, uh, changes in primary elections, et cetera. Um, for the most part, these seem to either reinforce polarization much later on, or in fact, didn't change very much during this time period. Uh, and so scholars have largely sought out alternative explanations for this, this increase in polarization that begins in the 1970s. We have, for example, Francis Lee, who observes that we now, that uh, as the House of Representatives began to get a little bit closer, Republicans to be begin to change the, strat the strategies that they use, uh, which could in turn cause polarization. Um, we, we, we observe, um, Sean Theriot says, well, maybe Newt Gingrich did it. Maybe Newt Gingrich uh, was uh, responsible for a change in the, in the attitudes and strategies of Republican Party elites. He shows up in the late 1970s. So we're, we're still looking for things that happen around this time and, and, and kind of seismic events that could cause polarization to increase. Uh, Jones et al. in their great book, The Great Broadening, uh, they observe that maybe the increase of new issues, the entrance of new issues as government expanded its role, the federal government expanded its role uh, in the regulation of the economy in the 1950s through 1970s, eventually leads to more issues being incorporated into, into political parties. And then, and thus we have this kind of uh, more polarized, more ideological set of issue positions that the parties have to take positions on. I think these are all great causes of polarization. I'm going to add another one. I'm going to, in this tradition, going to go look back to the 1970s and figure out what could possibly change during that time. And there's obviously other explanations that other scholars have posited. And I'm going to point to what I think is a seismic event in American party politics, uh, which is the creation of the Heritage Foundation in 1973. The Heritage Foundation is a, a partisan think tank. Today, it is a very large partisan think tank. And it was created, at least the legend has it, when three Republican uh, congressional staffers, uh, specifically uh, Paul Way Wayrick, who's pictured here with Ronald Reagan, uh, who would eventually go on to lead the organization for, for, for decades, uh, were upset with another partisan think tank's uh, policy, uh, 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 policy agenda. They, uh, that partisan think tank, the American Enterprise Institute, had released a report criticizing uh, subsidies of the Condor, of supersonic transatlantic passenger jets. Uh, and uh, released that report that, that offered very conservative conclusions, but released it shortly after the vote took place in Congress, so after it was already law. And the staffers were unhappy with that, were unhappy that the, the leading kind of source of, uh, of conservative policy ad uh, advice uh, was releasing things kind of not timed to the agenda and, and, and in not in a way that would, that would directly influence the positions of their party. They decided to found the partisan think tank, the Heritage Foundation, in order to both provide much more conservative policy conclusions than the sometimes they thought squishy American Enterprise Institute, um, and also to do it in a way that's timed to the agenda and designed to maximize their policy impact. In this way, they're acting much more like an interest group than they, do, than they are like a traditional think tank. They are very successful. They are quickly integrated into the Republican Party's policymaking apparatus. Ronald Reagan is, in, is instrumental 
uh, in, in this quick integration. Um, famously, uh, there was a, a document the Heritage Foundation wrote called the Mandate for Leadership, which provided a large number of policy recommendations for the early Reagan administration. Uh, they, uh, uh, Ronald Reagan famously passed out copies of this Mandate for Leadership to members of his cabinet during his first cabinet meeting. Um, they became more successful in, uh, throughout the Reagan, the Reagan presidency at advising Reagan and members of Congress, and were qu quickly became the most important policy analysis organization within the Republican Party. But why should that make a difference, right? So that's a story that's an interesting story. Uh, there, there's a there's theoretical question of why heritage was different. Um, and they were actually quite innovative in the way that they approach politics. Traditional think tanks employ what, we, what, uh, uh, what is called the university without students model where you hire a bunch of people to do policy research, maybe you hire some people who are left or right of center, some people who, you, who, who, who are gonna offer policy that you agree with, and you just let them do their thing. Uh, they produce research, like many of us that produces research without particular, you know, particularly important timing, without an agenda, without a PR team behind them. Um, this uh, was supplanted when Heritage develops what McGinn and, and others call the advocacy model. The advocacy model is this idea that a think tank functions much more like an interest group. They plan out their policy agenda. I, I've discussed with people um, who, who, who plan out these meetings, you know, how they approach kind of a month by month uh, a set of research that, that they would release. They release much shorter papers. They release things that are more targeted, that are more useful in advocacy and are more persuasive. They have an explicit ideological and partisan bias. Heritage in particular is strongly associated with what today we would call movement conservatism. Um, and they have a grassroots-ish fundraising design. Grassroots-ish mean we're still relying on very rich people, but we're relying on larger numbers of very rich people to donate, you know, tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of dollars, rather than organizations like the American Enterprise Institute, which at the center right at the time relied on corporate donations. Corporations are very small, C so conservative. They would prefer uh, uh, essentially less radical policy prescriptions, and they kind of held back in a lot of the policy activities of some of these organizations. This is copied immediately by virtually everything that it's think tank that is created after 1973. So Heritage is immediately successful and every new think tank, including a rash of conservative and progressive think tanks, copy that model after 1973. This is actually quite explicit at times. Um, I, I, I talked with a, a, a senior member of the Heritage Foundation who claims at least that they consulted uh, with the creators of the Center for American Progress, which is the leading democratic aligned uh, 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 today partisan think tank. And uh, and and so he said that you know they, they were so into their think tank design that they were even willing to help out the other side because they were very proud of it. Today, they've become deeply integrated into the policymaking operations of, of both political parties. Both political parties rely on large partisan think tanks to, to help them make policymaking decisions. If you look back to almost all of the major plans that are introduced uh, by, part, by political parties, most of them have their origins at part policy th uh, partisan think tanks, especially on the issues that are most important to political parties. Uh, they do this by occupying what in other democracies is called the party think tank role. So in other democracies, political parties have formal party organizations to provide them policy analysis that's either directly controlled by, by, by the political party or de facto controlled with public fundings, for example, through a university. And they use these to help them make policy making decisions to take policy, uh, take policy positions to appraise the world. We don't have that in the United States. There is no formal party organization to provide policy analysis. The DNC, the RNC, et cetera, provide very little policy analysis. We rely on private organizations to, to occupy this role, and it allows them to be particularly influential. Now, I am not the first uh, scholar to observe this relationship between partisan think tanks and polarizations. We kind of get to a theory of how they might impact politics. Uh, this wonderful paper, paper by Bertelli and Wenger uh, proposes that there is a relationship between um, that there is a relationship between um, uh, polarization and partisan think tanks, but it's a demand side relationship. The idea being that as polarization increases, they argue that there are more competing policy claims that must be adjudicated by policymakers, and so they seek out think tanks to help them adjudicate those competing policy claims. I think this is a great paper. I think this is a strong argument, but I'm actually going to make the opposite argument here today. I'm going to make the opposite argument uh, that partisan think tanks uh, actually may cause polarization, might convince their part that their co-partisans to take more extreme policy positions. And they do this by adopting different policy preferences and advancing competing policy claims not advanced by, par uh, by partisan sources. 
Um, so they convinced their co-partisans to take a different view of how policy interacts with the world uh, by putting out reports and by being persuasive, by making you know, good faith arguments that they maybe they believe in, maybe they don't believe in, but I suspect that they do believe in uh, about the way the world works. Uh, we can see this, for example, in, in um, uh, the relationship between tax cuts and deficits. So I think most mainstream economists, we would all agree, would agree that if you cut taxes, you will likely net increase deficits over time if you don't, if you don't cut spending. Um, and that, uh, you know, although you might eventually grow your way out of those tax cuts, that, that tax cuts do not have the kind of large macroeconomic impact necessary to quickly recoup their deficit losses. However, this is a widely shared belief inside the Republican Party. Jones and Williams show that uh, it's actually very, it, it, that uh, a lot of the information that uh, persuaded Republicans to adopt this alternative view of the world originated from Republican think tanks, specifically the Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute. Much of the uh, uh, the discussion around you know uh, the, the 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 greater impact of something like a corporate tax cut on the economy comes out of these these partisan think tanks rather than out of, for example, academia or nonpartisan institutions. We also see this on issues like climate change. There's a, a flood of research that shows that uh, that climate change is um, uh, is uh, that climate denial uh, research largely came out of something to the north of 80% of, of climate denial research um, came out of um, uh, came out of the um, uh, the uh, Republican aligned think tanks in the 2000s. They are able to do this because they occupy that privileged partisan think tank role. They can elbow, elbow out other information sources. To a political party, they're friends, they're allies, they're on the same team, they're people who agree with them. Um, me most members of Congress, are, at least on most issues, are not you know, policy specialists. They're not developing their own independent ideas about public policy. They're trusting people who they agree with, and they trust their allies in partisan think tanks uh, to provide this information. But there's a problem. And the problem is, is that these are privately financed and privately controlled organizations. They're interest groups. They have policy priorities. A formal party think tank in uh, many other democracies is controlled by the party. And so its mission is to support the policy goals and the electoral goals of that political party. A party think tank that is privately financed and is a private interest group has its own goals and it seeks to change the policy positions of the primary. If it does so on net, we assume that I can assume that their positions are to the left or right of center. They will create, they will convince their party of having more extreme positions and therefore increasing polarization. So that's a theory. I think it's a fairly straightforward theory. How do we study this? We're going to study it with some time series data. So I have a time series here from 1973, the creation of the Heritage Foundation, to 2016 of the four largest partisan think tanks. Uh, these are the Heritage Foundation and the American Enterprise Institute on the right, and the Center for American Progress and the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities on the left. These really are a big four. There are many other small partisan think tanks, but these are the four by far that are largest by revenue and largest by influence. Um, they are, uh, I can study them first by comparing their activities to DW Dom, the DW nominate difference of means, Italian measure polarization. I take the average of both chambers. Uh, and then I can look at the Heritage Foundation's revenue over time. Unfortunately, do not have the full series on all four uh, on all four think tanks. That those data are not available. But through a variety of archival sources, I have uh, uh, pieced together the real revenue of the Heritage Foundation during full time series with only one interpolated year. The best way I can measure all four uh, is by measuring how frequently they testify before Congress. Every time they testify before Congress, that appears in the congressional record. I can use. Uh, ProQuest Congressional to uh, find every instance that, that any of these organizations testified before Congress and record it. Um, and so we know how frequently per how many witness, uh, witnesses they send to Congress per congressional hearing. I still have some data on the media. I'm not going to show you that data today, other than to say uh, that I probably there's probably no non-spurious correlation between media attention by partisan think tanks and um, and the uh, uh, their their and polarization in Congress. Here's the curve. Here's our dependent variable. Polarization in Congress over time, we can see a big problem here. We're doing time series work on a secular trend. This is a trend that is increasing and it's only increasing. It doesn't go up and down. As a result, we, it is very difficult to make good inferences about the relationship between some independent variable and this trend. Literally any variable with a slope greater than zero will be significantly related to this trend. But um, we can do some, some things, which, I'll, which, I'll, which I, I've done in the paper, and, and I'll, I'll say orally here today, to kind of suss out a little bit more of that relationship. 
Still, you should be very skeptical of any line that has a significant relationship with this trend. Uh, so you have to find a very close fit to be confident this is not a spurious relationship. So the first line I'm, gonna, line I'm going to put on there is the Heritage Foundation's real revenue over time. So the Heritage Foundation, we have their inflation adjusted revenue over time compared with polarization in Congress, and here it is. So this is a close relationship. Uh, I don't think I need, I need to tell you that these are highly correlated series. They're both increasing at roughly the same time as the Heritage Foundation gets bigger, polarization in Congress, Congress increases. I can tell you a few, a few more complex things about this. When I eliminate the trend, when I regress both variables on a trend variable and take the residuals, there is still a significant relationship at time t uh, for both variables. They're, they're advancing simultaneously. And at points during the series, there's a significant relationship at time t minus one, time t minus one heritage revenue and time t polarization, which, we, which is what we're looking for to imply a causal relationship. But these are still largely simultaneous series. The great deal of variation here is occurring simultaneously. But I think it's persuasive that there's a non-spurious relationship between these two variables. There's a very close relationship between increasing polarization and increasing size of the Heritage Foundation. It's also only one think tank. So we can look at other think tanks and examine that same relationship at this time using witnesses per congressional hearing. And that here we can see that this is a, a similarly close relationship with one very interesting year, which I'll talk about. I can also tell you that when we detrend these relationships, there's a significant relationship between witnesses at time t minus one and polarization at time t, which is good. That would imply a causal relationship. And without the trend, there is no significant relationship simultaneously. So that tells us that congressional that Congress is calling more partisan think tank witnesses before Congress test to, to testify, before polarization increases, if slightly before. That's what we would expect if there's a causal relationship between these two variables, although I think it's actually a little more complicated than that, which I'll discuss in our discussion section. You'll also notice 1995, 1996, big Congress, followers of Congress. That's the, I'm probably not the only uh, con Congress scholar that that's the only number I remember. Congress in the 104th Congress is 95 to 96. It's a big Congress. It's the first Congress Republicans take over Congress, and it's the big Congress for think tanks. In fact, think tanks often call this the, quote, year of the think tank, which is a very humble way to describe it. Um, these think tanks uh, testified in record numbers before this Congress, mostly to implement promises made with the Contract with America, which was a set of policy promises uh, by the Republican uh, Republicans running for Congress in 1994. This is notable because they wrote many of those, of those policy promises, lot, many of them on welfare, or the, the big promise on welfare reform, was very, think tanks were very important to, as were, as were several others, and I'm going to talk about one in particular. But they wrote a bunch of promises, they were called to testify before those, uh, while Congress was debating whether or not to pass uh, provisions within the con contract with America. So that's that relationship. I'd like to interrogate this line a little bit. This uh, line is interesting. It's interesting in a lot of ways. It could have, it could have confounding variables and causes that we could talk about. Uh, one thing that, that, um, uh, that, that we know also occurs at this time is there's a tremendous cut to congressional capacity. The nonpartisan information sources at the CBO, CRS, and Office of Technology Assessment are dramatically cut at this time. And so we can overlay that series on this series and we get this a clear negative relationship. You can also see a secondary negative relationship uh, at the very end, tail end of the series where you also have further cuts to congressional capacity as polarization is increasing. So this is, in, I'm sorry, as witnesses are increasing. Um, so this I think tells a coherent story and it's a coherent story because this promise was in the contract with America and it was written originally by the Heritage Foundation. Uh, the Heritage Foundation published a book in 1988 called the Imperial Congress. And that book um, uh, made the argument that we should do exactly this. And then they testified before Congress when it happened. Finally, uh, we can also compare other nonpartisan information sources to see if this is a demand for outside information rather than inside, rather in response to, to cut congressional capacity rather than just for partisan think tanks. Uh, and so we can, for, for example, put Harvard University on this line and we can see that Harvard University influence is decreasing. So we're not demanding more outside information. We can put the Brookings Institution, uh, Brookings Institution on this line, see that's a flat line. We could put Yale, we could put Stanford. We observe the same thing. So we can, I think we can conclude from this that this is not increased demand for at least these types of nonpartisan outside information. What we, what we observe here is increased demand 
uh, for partisan think tanks. We also observe very large magnitudes where partisan think tanks, despite being much smaller than many of these organizations, produce far less policy information than many of them, are called upon to testify far more. So this is the end. I think we conclude, conclude that there's a clear non-spurious relationship between partisan think tank activities and polarization in Congress. However, my inference is that the correlation is too close to imply causation. That is, if we concluded that there was a causal relationship between, a simple causal relationship between these two variables, we would conclude that there's a monocausal cause of polarization and that is partisan think tanks. That is clearly wrong. Polarization is a complex phenomenon. It is not monocausal. And so we should think about partisan think tanks as a possible mechanism through which other forces polarize political parties, such as donors, activists, and intellectual changes. This is a part of a larger book project, but I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Thank you all very much. I'm really looking forward to Q&A. Thanks, CJ. Uh, and now to discuss uh, the papers by Jeremy and EJ, we have David Bateman from Cornell University. All right, let's well, we'll get started. So thank you uh, very much, EJ and uh, Jeremy for these papers. I really enjoyed them, I learned a lot. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, giving me the opportunity to discuss them. Um, so I'm going to start with EJ's paper, in part just because I think it sort of made sense intellectually for me to start with polarization and move on to sort of uh, the complications that polarization produces uh, when sort of interacted with the constitutional system. So I think that this is a great paper. I think it's a very nice complement to studies about the revitalized conservative movement in the 70s in particular. I think it's a great complement to studies of the sort of institutional and ideological networks who either have sought to polarize the parties or have sort of engaged in projects of polarization. Um, I think it is a novel take on polarization, and that's you know increasingly hard. Uh, so it's a novel take on, on polarization. I think the argument is reasonable. I think that there is it has this intriguing suggestion about its early importance in sort of kickstarting polarization. The findings are generally supportive, although I, I appreciate um, EJ where you end up with this sort of note of well, uh, there's too much <laughs> correlation for causation. Um, I'm also very glad to hear that as part of a book, book, book project, because what I really wanted more from this paper was just more in general. And uh, one of the things I wanted more of was a sort of more development of the argument. And I was wondering whether this might be a situation in which the argument could be, would benefit from some a more formal, at least more explicit and developed ex, uh, exposition about uh, at least two sides of it. One is sort of the demand side. Um, the other is sort of the uh, supply side. And so um, just sort of one Quick question, and this came up a little bit more in the talk than the paper, I think, was the story about whose preferences are being reconstructed. This is members of Congress's preferences are being reconstructed. The mechanism, however, by which those preferences are reconstructed wasn't always entirely clear. Uh, they select into it, seem, seemingly, in which involves a question of what are they really selecting into, um, but it also sort of seems to reconstruct them. But I, what, kind of what I wanted was something, some sort of discussion of the sort of the trade-off members have between sort of this universal desire to hear what we want and I largely, broadly shared desire to not look like an idiot, right? And so we could all at various points in our lives just, you know, go to the source of information that's going to sort of confirm our priors and maybe those might push us in a little bit uh, one way or the other. But presumably there's various sort of mechanisms that constrain us from doing this. And members of Congress presumably have, had, have some constraints about how much they can do this. And so I would just like some discussion um, of, of that. I'll come to that in a bit. Uh, related to that is this question of sort of why the era of low polarization beforehand. Um, there were ideological sources, partisan sources of information before heritage, but members didn't use them the same way, either because members didn't want them for some reason, because they didn't want to look like an idiot, uh, and they thought that they would look like an idiot, or maybe they may be related to that, they just weren't as credible. So what was the sort of the, the magic in particular that heritage was able to hit on, such that they appeared sufficiently credible that members could go to them thinking, I'm not gonna look like an idiot, <laughs> um, but also, well, they're also gonna tell me what I wanna hear. Uh, so why were these uh, not, not credible? And that's exactly the type of thing that I think you can explore in a book. So I'm very excited about that. And then the last set of comments is just gonna be, I would like you to sort of do a bit more work connecting the empirical findings to the argument. Um, all right. so. Uh, the argument uh, of the paper, um, uh, so a seismic change that occurred with the creation of the Heritage Foundation in 73, they believe the Republican Party's reliance on nonpartisan information uh, led them to avoid conservative pol uh, policy positions, uh, so that maybe positions that they would otherwise would take, but they didn't want to look like an idiot, um, because taking them was so clearly outside sort of some type of expert consensus. Partisan think tanks generate policy disagreements by advancing competing claims and allow members of Congress to seek out information that fits their ideological bias. Uh, and each other that's persuaded to support policy to the left or right at the conclusions of nonpartisan information. So I think that this, uh, this is sort of the basic statement of the argument, but I think it leaves a lot of open questions. Uh, and I think it could sort of benefit from a few more, a bit more explicitness about some of those. For one, is this a selection or an exposure story? 
Right? So if it's a selection story, then legislators are selecting into bad information on the basis of their ideological preference. Right? They're already polarized. Um, think, think tanks in this context facilitated the revelation of policy preferences that legislators had earlier felt constrained uh, because they were silly. Uh, they felt constrained from not endorsing. Right? It's like the idea that tax cuts produce revenue is silly. Only, you have to provide a sort of a certain degree of credible expertise to make you think that you can actually come out and say that, even though you may have always felt it and may have always believed and may have always wanted it to be true. In this case, think tanks become sort of a cover for members' preferences, right? So the ideological divergence is already there, the polarization might even be there, but what members were looking for was cover. Uh, an alternative, and I think more in line with what you're talking about, although I think that they're related, is that think tanks uh, actually reconstruct those preferences, right? And that the exposure to think tank expertise and think tank policy briefs and think tank proposals reconstructs what members want in such a way that it actually drives polarization. And so think tanks here might craft policies that map onto some more vaguely defined values um, and provide some sort of truthy sounding rationale for those policies. Um, so that, yeah, I don't necessarily think that tax cuts are gonna sort of produce revenue, uh, but you know, I think smaller government's good. Um, and so the provision of a truthy sounding rationale might lead me to adopt more extreme policies than would, than, um, would otherwise have been the case. And so this is intervening in the sort of uh, trade-off between um, hearing what you want and looking like a fool. In any case, the selection story sort of, you know, it doesn't help us so much in explaining and kickstarting the ideological divergence because that ideological divergence is already there. An exposure story might, however, sort of more dynamically sort of push people away uh, gradually. But then this raises another problem, um, and that, or another question at least, and that's the why no sort of treatment before heritage. Right? I mean, there were think tanks beforehand, right? This is the American Assembly, sort of as an Eisenhower vehicle, but it was like, it was an Eisenhower vehicle, but it wasn't a conservative partisan think tank. Um, uh, in the same way that the Heritage Foundation would be. So one simple question is just why, uh, why weren't these, like why weren't there things that looked like the Heritage Foundation before the Heritage? And the selection story might be that, well, it was because members didn't want to go to them. Uh, the members were actually looking for, like weighted the desire not to look like a fool when their beliefs were tested more heavily than hearing what they wanted to. Right? So that might be, the, there was not a demand for these types of institutions which then raises the question of why there, a demand emerges in the 70s. Um, yeah, there's also sort of this quality of like, I'm, uh, reading this, I kept thinking, well, does this sort of imply that 20th century members before the 1970s, right, were that were deferential to expertise, that they were sort of, uh, they had their pro ideological positions, and then when some, uh, you know, a Keynesian from the university came and said that that was wrong, <laughs> that they said, oh, well, if the Keynesian says it, well, we're on board. That, that doesn't seem to be my stereotype of 20th century members, but I'm trying to hard to reconcile that with a story in which uh, something changes in the 70s. Um, an exposure, right, in which the uh, exposure story in which the Heritage Foundation has a genuine role in producing polarization, these think tanks have a general role in producing think tanks, raises the other question. That's well, what were the factors preventing the supply of sufficiently truthy sounding, reasonable sounding, or credible sounding partisan sources of information before, uh, the, before the 1970s? And one possibility is just that they were all sort of operating in the shadow of the New Deal's big bang of administrative expertise. Um, and that for basically from, you know, 35 on, you know, nothing is credible that can't, like the only sort of credible positions are things that look either the liberal or conservative end of a basic New Deal framework, because <laughs> those are the only things that the universities and uh, the administrative state are able to produce as expertise, right? Uh, that's very much the Heritage Historic Foundation. Um, right? But then there's a question of, well, why didn't the John Birch Society <laughs> uh, try to do what Heritage did? Uh, or something else like the John Birch Society. Uh, what, I, why couldn't they get the magic that heritage had, that seemed to have? Which also raises the question of what about heritage? What was the magic of heritage? And so again, this is really why I'm excited about a book project here because I think you can find sort of a detailed discussion of heritage strategies might be very valuable, right? Some of the answers might be found in different fields, right? In the anthropology of knowledge or science and technology studies of how you sort of, how the sort of idea of credibility and expertise is produced socially. Um, and, you know, we all sort of recognize that there's some sort of hard thing as expertise and knowledge and that there's also some sort of squishiness in that that can be socially constructed. Um, but I'd love just more detail on not sort of the political strategy of heritage, but rather its knowledge strategy of what was the ways in which it managed to avoid being seen as a site of pure partisan hackery. Uh, 
and if it didn't manage to avoid being seen as a set of pure partisan hackery, then that's a selection story and members are knowingly selecting into bad information, which suggests that they're already polarized. Um, the last set of comments, and I'll go through these quickly, is just I would like a bit more sort of discussion connecting the empirics to the theory in this paper. So whenever I see multiple measures of a hypothesized cause, I want to know which you prefer and why, right? And so what I mean by that is not simply like, this is the cleanest, but this is the closest to what I think is the actual mechanisms going on. Uh, and so think tank testimony suggests that the biased information story is operating in Congress at the level of members of Congress on a committee calling hearings and hearing something or choosing who to call. Um, the overall spending suggests something different, it's sort of investment in knowledge infrastructure. We're mobilizing that campaigns and infrastructure, which might explain why you know, the heritage gets more money when um, more conservatives are elected and more conservatives being elected is one of the things that pushes polarization. Uh, newspaper mentions might suggest increased recognition of the importance of new knowledge infrastructure. That wasn't covered much in the talk, which is fine. But I'd just like to know sort of which do you think is the best? What would be your ideal? Because that would help sort of flesh out what you think the mechanisms are. Um, the use of DW nominated, I think that the great thing with DW nominated in this context is that it's gonna be less sensitive to uh, agenda coordination between the think tanks and um, sort of between sort of the think tanks and members of Congress. So that it's not simply that the think tanks are called in to justify what members of Congress wanna do in a particular year. Uh, still aggregate level of polarization is a pretty blunt measure of think tank influence. And so would we expect results to hold at the like, individual level or the committee level? I think for the first story, which is a biased information story operating in Congress, we would. And then just some other observable implications of the theory, right? So would we expect more polarized committees that think tank, uh, poor committees that uh, start calling in partisan think tanks become more polarized uh, over time after calling them in? Is there changes to the congressional agenda? Do these committees start copying and pasting think tank arguments into their reports in ways that suggest that they're actually changing the structure of the knowledge that they provide to Congress? Overall, I think the, the project's wonderful and I'm very excited uh, to reading it, to reading more. Uh, so on, on Jeremy's paper, Constitutional Prerequisites for Polarization, I think this is uh, a very interesting paper, very important. I think that the implicit incentives to build larger than minimal coalitions and the coalitions that endure cost of temporal fragmentation of popular sovereignty is one of the most consequential facts of the US Constitution. I find it hard to even think about American politics uh, in a way that doesn't think about that. And yet it's not really integrated into this account of polarization as much as it could be. I think like Howell and Moe, uh, Jeremy takes an appropriately constitutional view of the consequences of polarization, right? So polarization's not intrinsically good or bad in this story, or at least doesn't need to be but rather needs to be assessed against the capacity of the existing institutions to absorb it and to manage it. Um, and I think the paper has this nice sort of role of creatively connecting the current malaise uh, to the founding. One thing I think that you, the paper ought to do is bring up the consequences of polarization up front and start us off with, why does this actually matter? Uh, but by connecting the current malaise to the founding, right, the sort of need for super majorities as a result of the multidimensional politics of the convention, one thing that wasn't emphasized in the paper, but maybe worth drawing is out, is that the founders did often speak about sort of a difference between transient majorities and settled opinion of the people. And settled opinion was exposed and revealed through time. All right, uh, my first comment suggestion is going to be about a nitpick about the title. I'll just get rid of it right away. I don't think, pre think prerequisites is what you need, because this is not a prerequisite for uh, polarization. It's sort of an intermediary. Uh, it's a mediating factor. It doesn't produce polarization. It doesn't even encourage polarization. In fact, your argument seems to be that today's parties are curiously not obeying the incentives of the constitution to not be polarized, um, but that they are being polarized and they're running up against the complications that uh, the constitution proposes. So maybe the constitution exacerbating polarization, pending competing solutions, constitutional complication. I'm bad with titles as any, every reviewer has ever told me. So I will help you here, but I don't think prerequisites are the right term. Um, I think that there's the paper has this nice, very creative effort to connect convention dynamics to current problems. I'm not entirely convinced about the conventional stories uh, or about the uh, conventional coalition stories. Wasn't entirely sure that the problem really is an implicit need for a supermajority. Um, and I don't think that I wasn't sure that the problem is the existence of ideological parties, but rather the durable and durably efficient and rough symmetry of the ideological parties. Uh, and then I have a few sort of questions, which concluding recommendations. And I'll move through this quickly. So the coalitional dynamics. So this is the great table that you have. That was intriguing, but the connection between these coalitions and the relevant constitutional provisions are unclear. So whether or not the constitution created a strong presidency or how much people wanted to create a strong presen presidency, there wasn't any major division over whether or not there would be a president uh, and whether or not there would be a president with some type of veto uh, capable of being overridden by some amount. Uh, there was debate about it, but was it a serious sort of, of uh, division? Was there any division on the bicameral legislature? 
according to Madison, it was agreed to without debate or dissent except for Pennsylvania, um, which was just sort of giving up to Franklin. My understanding was it was the basis of representation and the mode of election that were controversial. And so the very the first is very relevant for your story, the basis of representation, because it's the Senate, the difference between the Senate and the House. I, uh, the second was less so since the 17th Amendment. And what struck me as more important was the sort of the timing of election. So this uh, temporal fragmentation of republic sovereignty. And I would like to know were the coalitions divided over that? And so I think just uh, the, the broad point would be sort of more specifically identifying how the coalitional dynamics shaped the final outcome. All right, so the next point is, are we really talking about supermajorities? Um, there are, you know, you say that there aren't explicit supermajority requirements. There are a few, right? Treaties, the override, Article 5, the Article 5 being the bigger one. Um, it's the limits to their use suggest that there was some type of deliberate opposition to a general supermajority requirement. And I wasn't sure whether the institutions actually incentivize supermajorities or rather geographically diffuse majorities. And so what you're looking for as a coalition is to build the large, the most geographically diffuse minimal winning coalition. Uh, and this, you might produce a supermajority in the process of doing so because you can't finally target as well as you could. So there's some inefficiencies, but what you're aiming for is a minimally winning coalition uh, in that sense. Or, you know, on the other hand, you might encourage, it might encourage supermajorities in the expectation of being chipped away, right? Here, the temporal response to this is key again. So I was wondering whether the uh, encouragement for super, uh, supermajorities might really be restated as the constitution encourages a minimally winning coalition, a minimally winning diffuse majority <laughs> capable of lasting past a presidential term. Uh, and so it doesn't need to be a supermajority, it can in fact be almost like just a bare majority, as long as it's diffused. Uh, and as long as it can endure past the presidential term. Uh, the, whether the ideological parties were the problem. It's, I was wondering whether it was ideological parties with a surprisingly durable and efficient balance between the ideological parties, right? US elections in recent decades have been remarkably efficient, right? Every election is a nail biter, not that votes are wasted, not that many votes are wasted in one sense. And parties have somehow struck this sort of stable and kind of symmetric. We know that you know the parties are not asymmetric in their polarization, but kind of symmetric balance between people who actually positively and positively identify with the parties and want to vote for them, and those who just view the other party more negatively. Right? There does seem to be something about uh, the asymmetry in that regard between them that leads to highly efficient elections that are very very competitive. In previous periods of dominance, of one party dominance, they didn't start with a non ideological party. Jefferson was radical in 1800. Jefferson, when he imposed the self-embargo, was radical in 1807. Right? The Republican Party was radical. The, Republic, the Democratic Republican Party. The Republican Party in the 60s was radical in the 1860s. The New Deal was radical. Uh, it started with two ideological parties, but one party either just kept going off the deep end or no longer fit with the problems of the time. Right? They were sort of bound to an existing, pre-existing set of ideological positions that was increasingly anachronistic. So it wasn't that you had a non-ideological party, but rather you had one ideological party and another that just went crazy. Um, and what happened was that the non-ideological, the, uh, the, the dominant ideological party just gradually redefined what ideology meant. And so what's surprising here about the current era is that while they both seem to be going further and further, neither seems to be going off the deep end enough, right? That they, they're able to maintain their competitiveness. And that was what was not the case in early eras. All right, and finally, uh, sort of uh, sort of ends with this sort of discussion about was it constitutional reform or is uh, the party change? And one thing that seems to be missing is the filibuster, right? You say in a footnote that the filibuster is endogenous, but that kind of sidesteps the issue because on the one hand, its endogeneity suggests some greater moderation on the part of the parties. The median senator wants somebody else to be making decisions who is going to be making more conservative or more liberal decisions than they otherwise would. Uh, more, more important, the fundamental question is like, <laughs> The question of constitutional reforms or vague hope for parties right, sets up a false alternative, right? There's another possibility right in front of us, and that's abolishing the filibuster, which might have one possible advantage. It would force parties, when they have a majority, to govern uh, and to govern in line with how they want to. Governing, the ability to govern forces some responsibility and designing policy towards popularity rather than towards reconciliation might actually allow one party or the other to become the dominant party uh, and reconstruct what the ideological terrain looks like. Uh, but otherwise, I think that the project is very much on point and excellent, and I hope I didn't go too long. Thank you very much. Not at all, David. Excellent as always. Um, so why don't I give Jeremy and EJ a chance to respond and provide some thoughts on what David uh, just noted here. Uh, Jeremy, did you want to go first? 
Sure, I'd be happy to go first. Uh, David, thank you very much for those comments. They are uh, well taken. I appreciate them. They're going to help me sharpen this paper a great deal. I'm not going to try to talk about all of them. In fact, I may try to follow up with you to sort of clarify a couple of them um, because they are so good. Uh, a couple of that I just really like, I just want to say this, the, the idea between transient and settled opinions is something I have thought about, and I didn't really figure out how to work it into this paper. Um, but I want to figure that out because I think you're making a good point that and maybe one way it could connect is that in our current period, we have a lot of, we have parties that have very settled opinions with a lot of voters who probably have transient opinions. I didn't really think of that way to bring it in until now, but I, I think that's a that's a good thing. Prerequisites may not be the right title. This title, this paper has had 11 different titles, I believe at various points, I, I share that. Um, I share the view that maybe it's not the right title. Um, I really like the way you put the geographically diffuse coalitions is the actual thing that, that they have. I think in the context of the founding, they did think of that as a super majority. And I also think that it is, I want to think a little bit more about this, but I think I could make the case that that's just the most common supermajority that we're talking about here, but that it could be built other ways in, in certain respects, although geography is always important because of the Senate, but I do want to think about that. On your point about how one party goes off of the deep end, as I was rewriting it for this conference and trying to figure out some quick revisions to make to it, uh, to, to get it in final form, I did think about putting that in that it does seem like what is likely to happen is that eventually one of our two parties is going to go so far that the other party will reap the benefits. I'm not sure that's a prophecy that I'm willing to make, but it seems likely to me. And then lastly, I'll say on the filibuster. So this is probably my only point of mild disagreement with you. I, I think we place too much emphasis in our discussion of polarization on the filibuster. I was going for a uh, an approach that hopefully emphasized how there's more to polarization than the filibuster. And I may not have been entirely successful in that. I think you're right to say that I sidestepped this endogeneity problem. I, I, I'm not gonna disagree with that, that's completely correct. Um, but I think we focus on it too much and I need to figure out a way, or at least I'm going to try to figure out a way to sort of bring it in, but also note, this is not the entire story. And I, I will say that I don't believe that if we simply eliminated the filibuster, that that would have a massive effect on polarization. I, I doubt that it would. Um, uh, but I will leave it there uh, so that we can get to more Q&A on that. I really appreciate the comments. Okay, uh, EJ? Yeah, David, again, thank you so much. This is great. There's a lot in there and I'm gonna try to leave most of it uh, unresponded to so we can talk about Q&A. But let me talk about, uh, let me talk about some of the big ones. Um, this idea that this is a book, you know, this is an article, it has to stand on its own. And so I hate to say, you know, read more. I, I, there's no read more button in the article. And I, I maybe I made the mistake of promising Jeff a short article. Maybe we'll be talking about making it making a longer article uh, after your comments. Because I, I do think you're right that a lot here is unexplained. Um, but let me answer some of those, I think, interesting questions. I am making an exposure argument. I do, I, I'm explicitly making an exposure argument um, that this was information that was not presented, at least wasn't out there in a way that could affect public policy previous to the Heritage Foundation. Um, and maybe there's a selection argument that I think is more of a selection bias argument in there, that once that information is out there, we all have very powerful biases, and maybe we ideologically believe uh, that maybe government should be smaller, and so we're more likely to believe findings from people who who, uh, who would agree with our ideological biases. Uh, but I don't think it's just a matter of these biases were pre-existing, and, there was, and, and these, these um, organizations provided cover out there. I actually have a, a chapter in the book, again, read more, explaining, explaining that. Um, but, uh, and, and I, and I definitely need to kind of make that explicit in this article. I think, I think I'm going to be adding a little more of a, more, more theory to this article uh, about that relationship. But the big question you have is what's special about heritage, right? So why, why does heritage show up in 1973 and why were previous efforts like heritage unsuccessful? The short answer I think is, I personally think it's, it's largely an entrepreneurial story, which is not a great story for social science, right? It's, there's, there's not, you, you know, just saying, well, Paul Way, Wayrich figured it out isn't a great explanation for social science. But here's what I will say. I think there is strong evidence that neutral and nonpartisan sources of expertise were very dominant during the non-polarized period. Um, uh, again, there's a read more, there's, there's a read more problem here a little bit. Um, but also, I think that um, if you look at the founding of the modern conservative ideology that eventually is kind of taken by, you know, taken by heritage, that's founded explicitly in opposition to that body of expertise. Um, and and it, it's, it's in God and Men at Yale in 1954, and it, it's very much in, uh, in the communications of both Republican Party uh, 
um, kind of in intellectuals and elites you know, during during this time. But if you look at the Nixon administration, the Ford administration, the Eisenhower administration, they're listening to the Keynesians. They're listening to experts. Can uh, um, Nixon had that famous quote, you know, we're all Keynesians now. Uh, Heritage observed this and hated it. it they, were, they were the enemy and, and, and their goal was to get them out. We now think about academia and about you know, neutral expertise as essentially having a left-wing uh, bias. But my, I, what I would argue is, is that is really just the framing by these particular conservative activists of framing neutral expertise, expertise as something as having a conservative bias. Um, we expanded a lot of government in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And by expanding that government during that time, uh, when doing so, we relied on neutral experts. Someone had to write those programs, had to staff those organizations, and, and be, develop that policy expertise. And all of that was kind of leaving conservatives in the dust. They grew naturally skeptical of everything that all of these people who were expanding the role of government were doing. This is a story that's told very well in Jones et al.'s book, The Great Broadening, that I, I strongly recommend to people. Um, and so I, I think that you know you have this entrepreneur, entrepreneurial moment coupled with the raw material um, from from these decades of policymaking that allows this to finally be successful. I think someone would have come around and figured this out if not for Paul, Paul Weyrich. But I think the reason why it doesn't occur till 1973 is, is that expansion of government that occurs, which kind of gives them that raw material um, and also does things like, as Hacker and Pearson has shown to activate business and donor classes and all and, 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 the, and those types of things. Uh, so again, that's why I, I don't think they're a monocausal. Explanation. I think I think there's a, there's a clear mechanism here, and they're they're uh, they're an important piece of the story, but clearly not the full story. There's lots of other stuff I can answer. Um, thank you so much. I'm going to be working on this a lot, and, and hopefully you'll see it in the finished product. Okay. Thank you, EJ. Uh, we've gotten a few questions through the Q and A box. Um, people should feel free to raise their hand among the panelists. Uh, this is the opportunity to write in a few questions. I'd like the questions to be. Uh, on point, perhaps, for the papers themselves. Uh, Jeremy or EJ, do you see anything here? Can, are, you, are you able to see the Q&A box at all? Okay. Anything you want to answer? Um, I'll just, uh, Michael Grant wrote in and asked if the Federalists were considered radical. And I, I we'd probably have to come to some sort of discussion about the definition of radical. But it, I, it is... I think it is the case they just become a non-entity and a non-factor outside of New England and a few other enclaves post-1800 election. Uh, if that means they were too radical, I'm not entirely sure. But this, I think, is a pretty good example of something David was talking about in his comments that uh, one party goes off the deep end. And in the case of the Federalists, I think the way they went off the deep end was to focus on um, a set of policies that were unpopular and that were focused on New England. We may see that now, where one party eventually goes off the deep end, although it it uh, it hasn't happened yet. EJ, did the did the sort of the public facing success of the Chicago School, uh, Milton Friedman and others, uh, help make heritage more respectable? I think so. I mean, yeah. you know, I can't call Milton Friedman as somebody who's outside the economic mainstream, right? Milton Friedman won a Nobel Prize. He was a widely respected economist in the Chicago School, was a part of that discipline during the time. Um, however, he's writing far earlier than the polarized period. Um, and specifically Hayek, who is enormously important to the Heritage Foundation, he was on the Heritage Foundation board very early, is writing in the you know, late 1930s, 1940s. Uh, this is, th that story happens well before polarization. And so it's a maybe it's a it's a foundation or it's a necessary condition that's created an intellectual basis for, for conservatism, but that basis is not translated into Republican Party elites until much later. And so I think that what they do is they take this information put out both by mainstream conservative leading economists, someone like Milton Friedman, and also much more radical economists, someone like a Hayek, um, and even further, you know, political theory by play from places like Ayn Rand. Uh, and you know the National Review and all and all sorts of things, and kind of takes that and translates it into politics. It's a necessary bridge between those two communities. And I would argue that if if they didn't exist, you you know Milton Friedman doesn't have a, as much of a, a kind of purchase to uh, to uh, to hang on to. Nolan McCarty wants to. Um, yeah, I just want to follow up on that point. Yep. I guess what I'm I'm not quite understanding in that response is why we should expect. Uh, these intellectual contributions to simultaneously translate into electoral politics, uh, therefore to be causal. Uh, Barry Goldwater ran for office in 1964, you know, under using most of these ideas. They just weren't very electorally successful. 
So you need something like the congruence, both of the ideas and the electoral acceptability of those ideas. And so in, in some sense, the kind of high contemporaneous correlations between the production of ideas and their electoral impact that translates into polarization uh, actually is not what I would, would expect from a model you know, of think tanks, which are, I think of as being designed to be kind of longer term uh, idea factories rather than kind of short term yeah. electoral messaging. I agree. And, and, and Barry Goldwater is such an important person in this story. I, I'd say this, that Goldwater, after Goldwater loses his election, there's not an infrastructure in place to take Goldwater and ideas and develop policy proposals and white papers to support them and arguments. Um, and, and that groundwork isn't, isn't laid until, you know, seven years later, not, not really that much, that much longer until the Heritage Foundation shows up. They count Goldwater as an ally. They, they see themselves as essentially fulfilling his tradition as the anti-Nixon, anti-Ford part of the party. Um, and so I, I think the, the reason why, you know, why you see Goldwater earlier is Goldwater is essentially an, er, er, an earlier manifestation of that. But then the Republican Party snaps back for the last time, really, with Nixon and Ford. Um, and so maybe the, this kicks off a little bit earlier, and maybe the Heritage Foundation is an important part of a, a part of that story early on. Um, but um, uh, I, you know, I, I, I don't. I think I think one leads to the other fairly clearly. Uh, you know, it, it, the they they thought the, the conservatives thought that you know doing Goldwater stuff was good politics, um, and maybe Goldwater lost for other reasons. Maybe he lost for the reasons really related to his conservative policy positions. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I agree that I think it's an important part of the story. I don't think it's a strictly electoral story, though. I, I really, I, I really do think this is a story, uh, in many ways, of convincing Republican Party politicians to adopt a different view of the world. Um, that that their their previous you know worldview was wrong, and um, uh, and yeah, you know, I, I think if, if you just when you kind of if you read these reports, and I've read far too many of these the, the reports put out by these organizations, they're written in earnest. They're written, um, you know, from you know, from, from true believers to true believers, and uh, and so I, I do think it's a it's a it was an important part of translating the Goldwaterian kind of ideological ideas into policy. So another kind of issue merchant, in in a yep. sense, right? Yep. Yep. Merchants of doubt, as a Ruskies <laughs> would say. Yep. So uh, Jeremy's going to answer Jeffrey Kopstein's question, and then we'll get to Monica after that. Uh, Jeffrey asks, I don't know if everyone can see that, but he's, he's connecting the fact that the founders were very interested in preventing tyranny. And that is certainly e extremely true. I think they were very interested in that. I think they lived in a world where they were. Um, I hesitate to use the word conspiracy theorist, but there are moments when when you read them, you know, discussing Parliament and the Crown, they sound a little bit conspiracy oriented. And and so I think they do create the system that is very effective at preventing tyranny of the majority, tyranny of some faction, tyranny uh, in uh, government. And I think you know that case is laid out pretty well in Federalist 10. I think the consequence of it is that it does connect to polarization because what they did left us with the trap that I was talking about, which is that if you can't create a really sizable uh, or at least geographically diffuse or the right kind of coalition that persists over time, well, you're just not going to be able to make policy. And there has to be, I think, some sort of gray area between, you know, are we defeating tyranny and are we unable to make policy? And I think, you know, my paper's trying to point out that we may be in a, we may be in a little bit of a, a zone in between those two where we're not really able to make policy. We are largely effective at preventing tyranny, though I will admit January 6th of last year gives me a great deal of pause. Um, and and uh, their laudable goal is not necessarily working out perfectly. And we might want to think about adjustments to the system if we could figure out a way to do that. Monica Nalapa at uh, University of Chicago. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so I was, uh, uh, I have a question or comment to EJ. I was really intrigued by uh, your point that, uh, that in other countries, um, think tanks uh, role is basically subsumed by party organizations because they're able to, to write policy. So at least looking at Eastern Europe, the, 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 the environment of think tanks is very rich and they also write policy. And moreover, they seem to be actually alleviating polarization. So like if you think about, you know, crisis on the Eastern border in Poland, like we would actually not know what's going on there if it wasn't for think tanks and, you know, the, the, the Center for Eastern Studies. And they seem to be like serving as a conduit between um, at least the Eastern European 
countries and the EU in terms of like informing whether, you know, the EU, ch EU charter is being followed and so on. So, um, and as party organizations have actually become stronger, so arguably more capable of writing their own policy, the, this, this, uh, this community of think tanks has grown. So, yeah, so I was just, you know, wondering, do, do you think that your observation is limited to two party systems maybe, or? Yeah, I think it could be. I, I, I think um, there's kind of two different types of think tanks. You have your private think tanks and your publicly funded think tanks. And I'm focusing on a relatively small number of, of private think tanks in the United States. There are many think tanks in the United States that occupy, uh, I think, what uh, an expertise promoting role and uh, a fairly nonpartisan moderate promoting role. Uh, and many other countries have these. I mean, as you mentioned, I mean, in, after the Cold War, UNDP recommended that when you're setting up a new democracy, one of the first things you do is you set up a network of think tanks. Uh, I think the difference here is that party think tank role and the control of the think tank by political parties. I'm not as familiar with Eastern Europe. I am as, I am fairly familiar um, with Western Europe. And in Western Europe, political parties very much have control of their think tanks, and they're very large and well-resourced think tanks. But one of the biggest think tanks in the world is controlled by the Christian Democrats in Germany um, and, and, their, and their corresponding uh, European political party. Uh, and they're office-seeking institutions, right? And, and an office-seeking party is, is not going to try to draw itself further to the extremes, especially in a multi-party system, because they'll lose votes. Um, but in the United States, they're privately funded, they're interest groups, they have goals. And I think that's, I think they've managed to carve out a very specific role. Um, but even this is, you know, um, very unique to the Republican Party. The, the Democrat Party has these think tanks. They're important. I think especially there's a question here on social issues has drawn the, the Democrat Party to the left on social issues just by my reading of, of reports from these think tanks in the 2000s. Uh, but um, the Heritage Foundation really is, um, I think, a, a uniquely powerful and important group that has kind of figured things out or at least adopted a different organizational form than many other think tanks in these other countries. Uh, that said, I would hypothesize that if I looked at this comparatively and we had countries with formal party organization controlled publicly funded think tanks and private organizations, you would see more polarization in the systems with private organizations. Uh, David, there were a couple of comments um, directed to you and your comments. So, yeah. So uh, one uh, anonymous uh, attendee sort of asked, um, average political views of social science of professors have become more left-wing over time. So perhaps in the 70s, conservative elites decided that nonpartisan experts were too different than them and political views be trusted. That creates a demand for conservative policy experts. I think that that's, like EJ, EJ's like point is right on there, that like there is, um, you're operating in an asymmetric in, informational environment. Um, and uh, that is being interpreted by conservatives at this juncture as a liberal environment. Uh, so that the epistemological community of what constitutes knowledge just seems to be liberal and they reject that. And so what's, and I think that like uh, Nolan's point that, I, you know, think tanks produce this sort of, uh, their ideas factories, um, I think is absolutely right. Uh, and so I, I think the sort of the big question like remains, or at least for me, of like, uh, what about heritage? <laughs> like, what was, why was heritage so good at seeming sufficiently credible that like, you didn't think you were like signing up for the John Bircher newsletter? Um, sufficiently credible that members of Congress felt that they could not look like fools, uh, but also was clearly sufficiently conservative. And so I would love some sort of detail of like, uh, um, you know, are they, is the way that they operate by like sort of giving experts, credential experts free reign, but only on topics where they know that exactly the policy position that they're going to get is the conservative policy position, like a strategic manipulation of the knowledge agenda rather than uh, total hackery. Here's what I'd say. I'd say the, the, you, the, I think the image of a report is simply stating like the title of the report being, think, you know, tax cuts don't cause deficits is, is not a good characterization of, of these reports. Um, what often is, what, what's often the case is they're proposing a program and they're estimating the cost of that program or they're, they're commenting on a bill before Congress and they're estimating the impact of that on some other things. I have, again, read more. I have a chapter in the book where I actually do this. I take out impact analyses on common topics. So everybody's estimating the impact of some policy output on some variable in the exact same way. And you just see heritage even more, than, way more than the American Enterprise Institute, way more than, than the, the Center for American Progress is just off to the right. I mean, they just they just make estimates that are that are extreme, but they're, they're presented like an academic paper. They're written by a guy with a PhD. Um, you know, 
I think if you're not an expert, you and and you're inclined to believe it, you read this paper and, and it looks like all the other papers. It looks like like a uh, like a, just a different cost estimate of the Affordable Care Act, and the Affordable Care Act is going to cost you know twice as much as the CBO is predicting. Um, if you and remember that this is a slow process, right? They don't immediately become super polarized, right? If you look at these early, very type, you know, typewriter written reports that Heritage, Heritage is is producing, you know, they're saying like, you know, maybe we should have these things called opportunity zones where we just don't have taxes on large amounts of economic activity, and that will increase economic growth. And Republicans are going, oh, that's a good idea. Maybe I maybe I should consider that. It's it's a lot more subtle than that. And uh, when no one's talking about kind of long-term policy ideas, that I think is what's occurring. And I, I have another model in another paper where I look at this kind of long-term effects of polarization of individual issues and think, think tank activity. There's no short-term effect at all, which is why I don't think this is just a selection issue. It's a long-term effect, um, which means it's basically a fixed effect, which is actually a little bit kind of difficult to, uh, to understand. Um, but yeah, so, so great point. Uh, Boris Shore from the University of Houston. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to uh, take my role as saying, what about states uh, seriously? And I'm going to ask EJ um, to think about looking at states uh, because there's a huge spatial variation in uh, think tanks and policy foundations across states. And um, so Texas, California, New York, Illinois, these places have extremely well-developed uh, think tanks sectors. Um, and it's obviously related to state size. Um, and, but states like, you know, uh, Rhode Island and Delaware and, and Wyoming are basically, basic, basically have nothing. Um, and so, you know, if, if, and the other thing I'd say is, you know, the, the, the amount of information that amateur legislators have at their fingertips um, as compared to members of Congress is, is, is a huge gulf, right? So if, if what you're saying is true, we should expect to see a much stronger effect at the state level, especially for amateurs in these, uh, in, in states where, in states where there's a, a you know, well-developed uh, think tank sector. It's a great point. Um, there's a, uh, I have not looked at states. Uh, however, I think you're completely right that there's huge variation in think tank activities by state. Um, and um, we've actually have some work on this from Alex Hertel Fernandez and Theta Scotchball. And what they've, they've shown is that the Medicaid expansion and at least some other um, climate change related policy were both much less likely in conservative states that have Koch funded Texas, pu Texas public, um, public policy foundations in them. Um, so the more activity that these, the, this, this kind of Koch network of smaller think tanks um, uh, have, have in these small states, the less likely you are to see kind of this kind of more mainstream policy outputs and the more extreme their policy is. Uh, but I take your point. I think it's a good point. And I think um, uh, it, it's definitely a good case for follow-up research. But yeah, at this moment, it's uh, it's not a part of the project at the moment. Right. Th th those things are about policy outputs, right? Which is not the same thing as polarization. But yeah, but anyway, yeah. Uh, Jeremy, did you have a last quick point? It's it's not so much a point. It's just, a, I guess, a question for uh, EJ. Um, Mildly biographical. When I I worked at the American Enterprise Institute many years ago, um, it was interesting in my position because I worked for Norm Ornstein, so I was working for a left wing guy at a right wing place, and I interacted some with other think tanks. And I guess I just wanted to ask you to comment more specifically on. It was my impression, and remains my impression, that Heritage has today even far more regimented control over the ideological distribution of who's at uh, heritage, a, a, just a much smaller distribution than you see in most of the other think tanks. I would say that was true, certainly true of Brookings. I think it's true of AEI. I think it's true for CAP. Um, I don't know. Have you looked at that? Do you have a comment on like how that's playing a role? Uh, I, I, AI is a fascinating institution. And I've looked at it quite a lot. Um, one, you're, you're right. It maintains a hybrid university with that student's model to this day. Uh, so they will hire scholars. They don't tell them what to write at any given time. Uh, they'll hire, a, they, they have a fairly diverse set of scholars there. Everybody from, you know, from an arm orange team to just normal academics doing work that, that people there find interesting to uh, Charles Murray, who is, uh, who, who, who's famous for, for quite extreme um, uh, uh, research. Uh, they have a hybrid model in that uh, what I've been told by, by, uh, by some people there is they will essentially hire temporary academics to come on board when an issue is on the agenda. So if uh, we're going to do a big renewable energy bill and they think it's coming this year, they'll bring in, excuse me, they'll bring in um, some visiting fellows 
to do work on that. It actually makes parts of this project hard because they don't time their, their, their way to the agenda the way the other three think tanks do. Um, this is because they were founded before Heritage, right? They, they, they consider themselves, um, and I don't think I agree with this, but they consider themselves essentially the inverse of the Brookings Institution. Um, that kind of think tank, not this kind of advocacy out there, think tank, et cetera. But they don't engage in some activity like they don't have a 501c4 branch. They're the only one of these think tanks that doesn't. Um, they have a 501c3 and they don't do any lobbying and they don't allow people to endorse candidates. They, they, are, they are very much separate from, from this activity. And I think it shows in that Heritage was, you know, kind of ate their lunch for a while. That said, they're called to testify more often than Heritage. They are considered a more credible source by many Republican Party policymakers, especially over the last four or five years. Um, they're also more frequently cited by Democrats in policy debates than, than Heritage is. Heritage is essentially never cited by a Democrat, but the AAI is quite frequently. Um, so I'm with you. I think it, it's a fascinating organization, and it's certainly different from those other organizations. Um, I think Center for American Progress is very much founded in Heritage's image. It's a very similar organization. organization. Uh, the organizational form of it is very similar. Okay, and I think that uh, wraps the first panel. Uh, thanks to EJ, thanks to Jeremy, thanks to David. And uh, we'll reconvene in seven minutes at 10.30. Uh, I'm just gonna leave my Zoom on and we'll get something to drink, but uh, I'll see you again soon. Thanks everyone. <laughs>